Dive with us into the fascinating world of biographies, histories, and speeches as we learn from the words of the past. Chapter 17 of The Life of Charles G. Finney This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Timothy Lucas The Life of Charles G. Finney by A. M. Hills The Estimate of Finney Made by Others Finney is a Theologian I have already given the opinion of Dr. Edward Beecher and Dr. Park of Andover of Finney's greatness as a preacher. Rev. Charles P. Bush, D.D., of New York City, describing his use of the law and the gospel in his preaching, said, the church being thus shaken as by an earthquake, and Christians aroused to pray fervently for God's blessing, Mr. Finney was prepared to preach to sinners. He began with the law, showing what its requirements are, what its penalty, and how just it is, how absolutely necessary to the order and stability of the universe, how even the law itself, as really as the gospel, demonstrates the goodness of the divine being and therefore how fearful a thing it must be to sin against such a lawgiver and against all the interests of the universe. There was something fearful in those sermons also. Indeed, it makes one shudder even after this lapse of years to recall some of them, that especially from the text, The Wages of Sin is Death. The preacher's imagination was as vivid as his logic was inexorable. After laying down self-evident principles of human nature and divine government, then drawing out scripture truth touching the same, making all plain and irresistible by argument and illustration, how he rang the changes on that word wages, as he described the condition of the lost soul. You will get your wages, just what you've earned, your due, nothing more, nothing less. And as the smoke of your torment like a thick cloud ascends for ever and ever, you will see written upon its curling folds in great staring letters of light this awful word, wages, wages, wages. As the preacher uttered this sentence, he stood at his full height, tall and majestic, stood as if transfixed, gazing and pointing toward the emblazoned cloud as it seemed to roll up before him. His clear, shrill voice rising to its highest pitch and penetrating every nook and corner of the vast assembly, people held their breath. Every heart stood still. It was almost enough to raise the dead. And yet that same mighty man, when speaking of the love of Christ or the peril of the soul in its sins, was as great in tenderness and pity as before in majesty and truth moved himself to tears and entreaties enough to break a heart of stone. Many seemed to think of him only as the stern, uncompromising preacher of righteousness. He was that, and more also, a Paul in doctrine, but touching and tender as John himself in his delineations of divine love. But he did not preach love as a mere instinct or a weak, mawkish, and indiscriminating sentiment. His God was not all pity but also a God of majesty and of law and of justice. His love all the more glorious because intelligent and because it saves from wrath deserved. Reminiscences, page 12 and 13. Nobody knows better than those who loved and admired this good man most that he had his peculiarities. What great man has not, but he was never accused of levity or insincerity. He was a plain, blunt man that spoke right on and always meant just what he said. His soul abhorred deceit and hypocrisy. Perhaps it is not too much to say that he saw the truth in greater clearness and more fully appreciated its value and importance than most men could. He was in fact a giant in intellect, in the grandeur of his thoughts and purposes, and in the sublime force of his character and this was enough to justify some of his peculiarities. It is said that he told one of the elders of the church at Adams before he was converted that Christians generally did not half believe what they professed. If I ever become a Christian, he said, I shall go into it with all my might. And he did. Page 19. Reverend R. L. Stanton, D.D. Cincinnati. When I heard Finney preach that winter, I stood in fear of him. 
I have heard many of the great preachers of the day, and I regard him as the greatest preacher I ever heard. I should say that Mr. Finney was a severe preacher. He held up the law as I never heard it held up before or since. He gave such delineations of sin as would make men literally tremble in their seats. On the other hand, I have never heard such exhibitions of the love of Christ. I recollect hearing him preach on the wages of sin is death. I timed him and he preached two hours. I never heard such delineations of the terrible wrath of God. I think Mr. Finney introduced a new style of preaching. The first three-fourths of his sermon was in a colloquial style, and in the latter part he would make such appeals as I never listened to anywhere. Reminiscences, pages 26 and 27. Honorable William E. Dodge of New York City. He was the most remarkable preacher that I ever listened to. He would hold his audiences an hour and a half or two hours, and no one seemed to think that time hung heavy. Professor John Morgan, D.D. I think those who were most intimately acquainted with Mr. Finney have come to the conclusion that he was a man who combined, in a remarkable degree, the intuitive and the logical powers. He had a wonderful intuitive power, and when he had arrived at his bold premises by intuition, whether taken from reason and the works of God, or from the word of God, he would reason from them with wonderful power. I came, therefore, to the conclusion that, although Mr. Finney was not a learned man, he had been such a student, such a thinker, had so profoundly reflected that he was really one of the deepest theologians that I had any knowledge of, and I have been compelled to compare him with President Edwards, as at least his equal. And President Edwards is confessedly one of the first theologians that our country has ever produced. In fifty years, if it be not now, I think that Mr. Finney's equality with him will be admitted. But I think that all of us felt that his spiritual power was that in which he most excelled. The influence which he exerted on souls was sometimes very strong. I remember times when he thought religion was declining in Oberlin, for his standard was so high that he wanted to have things at a very high pitch in order to satisfy him at all. I remember how he used to come and talk the matter over with us, and I used to quake as his mighty eye would fix itself upon me. I believe that he had much the same kind of influence over whole congregations, but I felt it especially when he addressed me personally. There was in him, in prayer, the most remarkable power that I have ever seen in any human being. Reminiscences, pages 57 and 58. Professor Barber of Yale. I remember hearing Rev. Dr. Barber in a long critical lecture declare that President Finney was the first great thinker who had ever adequately and fully maintained, in all its bearings, the doctrine of the freedom of the will. He named him among the foremost of the metaphysical thinkers of the world. Professor George F. Wright, speaking of Finney as a theologian, makes a striking comparison between him and Augustine and describes a system of thought as follows. It is expected of me to speak of President Finney in the role of an Augustine elaborating a theological system, and through it reaching onward with a direct grasp to the generations of the future. With, of course, many qualities that are in contrast, these characters, Augustine and Finney, certainly have numerous striking points of resemblance. Their early neglect of religion, the pronounced nature of their conversion, and the overwhelming flood of emotion that accompanied it, the philosophical cast of their minds, and, what is more in point, the mental furniture with which they began and carried on their expositions of the Christian system of thought, give a striking likeness to these remarkable men. Augustine knew no Hebrew, and very little Greek. Yet, in the opinion of those best qualified to judge, no single uninspired name has ever exercised such power over the Christian church, and no one mind has ever made such an impression on human thought. President Finney frankly acknowledged that, while he had studied Hebrew and Greek to some extent, he nevertheless did not consider himself competent to venture on any independent criticism of the scriptures in their original languages. Our English version was to him what the Vulgate was to Augustine. President Finney's system of theology may be described as a growth rather than a creation. He did not set himself to work in early life to write a symmetric treatise of divinity, 
It has not the pointless mediocrity of such a production. But his system is the outgrowth of a profound religious and extensive practical experience coupled with an unusual aptitude for philosophical speculation and logical discrimination. He has not interpreted scripture after the delusive and belittling method of the mere linguist, who is so buried in the details of the grammar and the lexicon that he can never see the broad current of general doctrine that underlies and comprehends it all. In his view, the Bible is a religious revelation to the common people, which does not, to any great degree, lose its perspicuity in a translation. Its main revelation is so plain that a wayfaring man, though a fool, need not err therein. It is a practical revelation of a highway of holiness, which is not a substitute for common sense, but a supplement to it. Regarding points in dispute, the characteristics of Finney's system are briefly these. 1. The human will is self-determining in its action. 2. Obligation is limited by ability. 3. All virtuous choice terminates on the good of beings and in the ultimate analysis on the good of being in general. 4. The will is never divided in its action, but with whatever momentum it has at each instant, it is either wholly virtuous or wholly sinful. 5. With regard to total depravity, he accepts it as a biblical doctrine that all the acts of men since the fall and previous to regeneration are sinful. 6. Regeneration and conversion are treated as synonymous terms, descriptive of a cutaneous act both of the Holy Spirit and of the human will. He is content to accept the facts and let alone the mystery, insisting, however, that the human reason is always so far respected that the truth is, in all cases, the instrument through which conversion is secured by the Holy Spirit. 7. The condition into which men are brought by regeneration is either that of continued holiness, increasing in volume, or of states alternating from entire holiness to entire sinfulness, the former state finally predominating and ending, according to the ordinary Calvinistic doctrine of perseverance in everlasting salvation. The final perseverance of the saints is accepted as a revealed truth which the reason cannot contradict, and whose mysteries are left with the Lord. 8. Likewise, the doctrine of election is maintained as being, in the wisdom of God, our only assurance that the salvation of any will be secured. There is a plan of salvation whose means and ends were chosen from eternity and which is now unfolding before us. 9. In this plan of salvation, Christ is the central figure a being who is both God and man, and whose humiliation and sufferings are a governmental substitute for the punishment of those who are sanctified through faith in his name. The atonement satisfies the demands of general justice, and its provisions are freely offered to all men. Reminiscences, pages 68-71 through 71. Professor Wright, in this careful statement of Finney's theology, scarcely mentions sanctification. But Finney gave more space relatively to the discussion of sanctification than any other theologian, more than one-eighth of his entire theology. He held that it was the privilege of God's people to be sanctified, that they were under obligation to be holy, and God expected it of them in this life. The discussion of this, however, and in what respect Finney failed to teach sanctification, we will reserve for the next and concluding chapter. We will make one more quotation from Professor Wright. It is an old saying that Calvinists preach Arminianism and that Arminians pray Calvinism. And so, in one way or the other, the whole truth of both is preserved by congregations of either stamp. This is not true. President Finney has, we believe, succeeded better than any other author, with whose writings we are acquainted in elaborating a system of theology which combines and harmonizes the truth of these contending parties. He has done this in part in a negative way, by not philosophizing over much. The charge of doing that pertains rather to the so-called old-school theologians, who burden the system with their inflexible theories of an imputed guilt which is not guilt, with an idea of obligation which is dissevered from ability. It is they who enter into the philosophy of regeneration and attempt to prove a universal negative regarding it asserting that it is an act of the Spirit which is not moral and persuasive. They undertake to prove that in regeneration the Spirit produces a change in those imminent dispositions, principles, tastes, or habits which underlie all conscious exercises. President Finney's example is invaluable in this, that he leaves no excuses for sin, 
that he presses home upon all present responsibility, that he exalts the atonement of Christ and magnifies the Holy Spirit. President Fairchild, I believe, was a graduate in the first graduating class of Oberlin. He was one of the earliest of the Oberlin students and spent his life in the college either as a student, tutor, professor, or the successor of Finney in the presidency of the college. He knew the great man as well as one soul can know another when the two are very unlike each other. He thus explains Finney's independent attitude in theology. Mr. Finney was taken from the world and not from the church. He was brought up with very slight associations with religious institutions or church influences. With a nature strongly impressible to religious truth and drawn to his contemplation as by a fascination, he had still stood apart from the church in the attitude of a critic upon her doctrines and her life. He had no such association with religious people as led him to look to them for counsel or to seek their guidance in the determination of his work. His natural independence of character led, doubtless, in the same direction. The training he had received in his pursuit of the law cooperated to the same result. He was not hampered by any associations from instruction in catechism or any forms of sound words with which the church indoctrinates her children and which, in general, are doubtless wholesome in their action. He came to the study of the Bible and the doctrines of the gospel with the same freedom of judgment and of rational instinct with which he had apprehended and embraced the principles of law and looked for a similar self-evident truthfulness. Thus he turned away at once from the old-school dogmas of sin in the nature, of obligation beyond ability, of the literal transfer of the sinner's guilt and punishment to Christ, and of regeneration by a change of nature. These, so far as he knew, were at the time the prevalent doctrines of the church. He found them, as he believed, in the Westminster Confession, and in discarding them he naturally felt that he was departing from the traditions of the church and taking a position in a measure antagonistic to that held by the ministry in general. The outspoken boldness of his preaching in these directions led, on the other hand, to apprehensions and suspicions on the part of many as to his soundness in the faith. And thus, all the influences conspired to confirm him in this somewhat independent line of labor. The strong conviction, beginning with his conversion and abiding with him to the end that he must look to divine rather than to human guidance, naturally disposed him to mark out a path for himself, and thus, probably unconsciously at first, he entered upon the career of a reformer in the church. The mission to which he felt himself appointed was that of saving men, and he rejected the old forms of doctrine because they were a hindrance and not a help in his work. He needed doctrines which he could preach, and which would move the consciences of men, and submitting himself to God, he had consciously yielded to the truth, and he came to depend upon the truth as the power of God unto salvation. Thus he was led to readjust and restate for his own uses as a preacher of salvation the great doctrines of grace. He was naturally a keen analyst in the range of philosophic thought, and few men have had an intenser relish for such studies on the ground of their own intrinsic merit. But it was not as a philosopher that he pushed his inquiries, but as a servant of Christ to whom a dispensation of the gospel had been committed. On his knees before his open Bible, sustained by the prayers and sympathy of one good elder, he wrought out his theological system. Not that he might become a reformer in theology, but that he might qualify himself as a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Other men in the churches were at the same time working for similar modifications of the old Calvinism, men like Taylor and Beecher in New England, and Beeman and Aiken and others in New York. But with these men, Finney had no communication. He had no opportunity to confer with flesh and blood, but received his word as the word of God communicated to his mind by the illumination of the Spirit. Thus he went forth to his work as a preacher with the full conviction that he had a message from God to man, and this conviction was strong upon him during the fifty years of his public life and labor. Reminiscences, pages 78 through 80. In closing this chapter, it is proper to attempt to locate Finney as a theologian. Many speak of him as if he were a Calvinist. Indeed, the phrase New School Calvinist is a vague, indefinite term under whose ample folds a multitude of theologians, who are unwilling to break away wholly from their ecclesiastical relations, are hiding from the horrors of Calvinism. Finney, 
was no Calvinist. We might arrive at this decision from several arguments. 1. He utterly rejected the Westminster Confession, declared he was ashamed of it and of the Scripture arguments made in its support. All his life long he held it up to scorn by his withering sarcasm and hewed it to pieces by his merciless logic. But the Westminster Confession is the embodiment and quintessence of Calvinism. Whoever rejects the former is no disciple of the latter. 2. To his dying day, true blue Calvinists feared and fought Finney. Dr. Charles Hodge turned all his batteries against him relentlessly, and Hodge was the incarnation of Calvinism and gloried in all its horrors and blasphemies. 3. The five points of Calvinism are 1. Unconditional election. 2. Complete redemption for the elect only, or limited atonement. 3. Fallen man is incapable of faith and repentance, or total moral inability. 4. God's grace is irresistibly efficacious for the salvation of the elect, and no others can be saved. 5. A soul once converted or regenerated is never lost, or final perseverance of the saints. Now, the first four of these, and all the awful corollaries and inferences drawn from them, Finney utterly repudiated a thousand times over in every kind of expression and argument. He once said in a sermon of the doctrine of moral inability, It is echoed and re-echoed over every Christian land and handed down age after age, never to be forgotten. With unblushing face, it is proclaimed that men cannot do what God requires of them. It is only moderate language to call this assertion from the confession of faith a libel. If there is a lie, either in hell or out of hell, this is a lie. Or God is an infinite tyrant. If reason be allowed to speak at all, it is impossible for her to say less or otherwise. In another place, he names one of the well-known doctrines of Calvinism and declares, No slander could be more groundless or more foul. At another time, he cried out against one of the shameful statements that make God responsible for the awful wickedness of this world. It is as vile a slander against God as was ever vomited out of hell. At another time, a man who had been made an infidel by Calvinism quoted to Finney, Is it not true that no mere man since the fall has been able wholly to keep the commandments of God, but doth daily break them in thought, word, and deed? Finney answered, Ah, my friend, that is catechism, not Bible. We must be careful not to impute to the Bible all that human catechisms have said. The Bible only requires you to consecrate to God what strength and powers you actually have and is by no means responsible for the affirmation that God requires of man more than he can do. No, verily, the Bible nowhere imputes to God a requisition so unreasonable and cruel. No wonder the human mind should rebel against such a view of God's law. If any human law were to require impossibilities, there could be no end to the denunciations that must fall upon it. No human mind could possibly approve of such a law, nor can it be supposed that God can reasonably act on principles which would disgrace and ruin any human government. Now I submit that it is an abuse of language to call a man a Calvinist who thus indignantly rejected all the doctrines that were the very heart and core and marrow of Calvinism. 4. I call attention to the fact that nowhere, either in England or America, did Finney preach with more hearty cooperation with his brethren, nor more in harmony with them than in Bolton, England, where John Wesley had done his most successful work, and where Wesleyanism was in the ascendancy. Joseph Cook once said in Boston that the Methodists had a theology that they could preach without making an apology for it. That is exactly what Finney learned on his knees, a theology that honored God and justified his ways to men. He learned it not from books, but from the book, and from the Holy Spirit's illumination. He was as original a thinker as Arminius, and we do not hesitate to say that whatever there was of practical value in his theology and a help to his soul winning was essentially Arminian. So far from being a Calvinist, he was just such an one as John Calvin himself would have burned at the stake with far more relish than he burned Servetus. Chapter 18 of the life of Charles G. Finney. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, 
or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Timothy Lucas The Life of Charles G. Finney by A. M. Hills Finney on Sanctification and its Results in Oberlin College History Closing Pictures we have seen in the foregoing chapter how President Finney came to be such an independent theologian by a perfectly natural process. The only theological books to which he had access were intensely Calvinistic, and he rejected their teaching. He had received a baptism with the Holy Ghost almost immediately after conversion, and that brought his heart in loving harmony with God and holiness. He had no knowledge of the subject whatever, and no theory either to oppose or defend. He only knew that he panted after God and holiness, as the heart pants after the water brooks. When he read in the Presbyterian Confession of Faith, no man is able, either by himself or by any grace received in this life, perfectly to keep the commandments of God, but doth daily break them in thought, word, and deed. His spirit-illumined soul resented it. He began to meditate deeply on the subject of holiness. The only theologies he had, he rejected. The only preachers he knew, he distrusted as unsafe guides. He worked out his scheme of sanctification without man-made helps or helpers. If he had had some judicious books on the subject of sanctification, I am persuaded that all would have been different. But there were few such books in the early part of his ministry and those he had never seen. Even John Wesley's Christian Perfection never came into his hands until 1836, when he had already filled the world with his fame, and his theology had practically taken its permanent form. Perhaps the wonder is that he thought so wisely and so well. For no one mind, however great, can think out everything correctly alone in so vast a field of thought as theology. In 1837, he delivered two letters to Christians in New York City on Christian perfection. There is very much of truth and value in them. The divisions of the first letter were, 1. I will show what Christian perfection is not. 2. I will show what Christian perfection is. It is perfect obedience to the law of God. The law of God requires perfect, disinterested, impartial benevolence, love to God, and love to our neighbor. 3. I am to show that Christian perfection is a duty. 1. Because God requires it. 2. Because God has no right to require anything less. 3. Should anyone contend that the gospel requires less holiness than the law, I would ask him to say just how much less it requires. 4. I will show that Christian perfection is attainable in this life. 1. This may be inferred from the fact that it is commanded. 2. That there is a natural ability to be perfect is a simple matter of fact. There is no moral inability to be perfectly holy. Strictly speaking, there is no such thing as moral inability. I have always maintained that Christian perfection is a duty and I am more convinced than ever during the last few months that it is attainable in this life. I am persuaded of this because, one, God wills it. Two, all promises and prophecies of God that respect the sanctification of believers in this world are to be understood of their perfect sanctification. Three, perfect sanctification is the great blessing promised throughout the Bible whereby are given to us exceeding great and precious promises, that by these ye might be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. Second Peter 1 Peter 1.4 If that is not perfect sanctification, I beg to know what is. Ezekiel 36 and 25, Jeremiah 33 and 8, Ephesians 5.25 1 Thessalonians 5.23 4. The perfect sanctification of believers is the very object for which the Holy Spirit is promised. 5. If it is not a practicable duty to be perfectly holy in this world, then it will follow that the devil has so completely accomplished his design in corrupting mankind that Jesus Christ is at fault and he has no way to sanctify his people who 
but to take them out of the world. If perfect sanctification is not attainable in this world, it must be either from a want of motives in the gospel or a want of sufficient power in the Spirit of God. Then he answers a number of objections and closes according to his custom, with eight remarks on the reasons why there is no more perfection in the world. The seventh is, they seek it by the law and not by faith. How many are seeking sanctification by their own resolutions and works, their fastings and prayers, their endeavors and activity, instead of taking right hold of Christ by faith for sanctification as they do for justification? It is all work, work, work. When it should be by faith in Christ Jesus, who of God has made unto us wisdom and righteousness and sanctification and redemption. When they go and take right hold of the strength of God, they will be sanctified. Faith will bring Christ right into the soul and fill it with the same spirit that breathes through himself. It is faith that must sanctify. It is faith that purifies the heart. Save in the second point, there is scarcely a flaw in that sermon. And the reader may be tempted to ask wherein Finney failed in the teaching of sanctification. Only by a careful analytical study of his teaching will one detect its limitation and the cause of his failure. The basis of his difficulty was that he fixed all his attention upon the will as the only faculty of the man that needed any attention in seeking holiness. This appears in his definitions and terms and arguments. 1. For example, take his definition of depravity. He admitted physical depravity, that 1. made the body diseased, 2. made the actings and state of the intellect disordered, deprived, deranged, or fallen from the state of integrity and healthiness made the sensibility or feeling department of the mind sadly depraved. The appetites and passions, the desires and cravings, the antipathies and repellencies of the feelings fall into great disorder and anarchy. Numerous artificial appetites are generated and the whole sensibility becomes a wilderness, a chaos of conflicting and clamorous desires, emotions, and passions. But he made nothing of all this physical depravity and said that moral depravity consisted in selfishness in a state of voluntary committal of the will to self-gratification. He, therefore, gave his whole attention to the rectification of the will as the only thing to be concerned about. He strangely forgot that, while the intellect was deranged and the sensibility was a wilderness, chaos of conflicting and clamorous desires, emotions, and passions. The will would have a hard time of it and be quite likely to be unsteady in its loyalty and devotion to God. He ignored that vast realm of chaotic desires, emotions, and passions that lie back of the will and underlie its activities. I have already quoted Finney as saying, I had known somewhat of the view of sanctification entertained by our Methodist brethren. But as their idea of sanctification seemed to me to relate almost altogether to states of the sensibility, I could not receive their teaching. Precisely this was Finney's fundamental error, and in this is the excellence of the Methodist doctrine of sanctification. It looks after the cleansing of the wilderness of depravity, the sanctifying of the chaotic desires, emotions, and passions the slaying of the abnormal propensities and appetites that are hostile to God and holiness. 1. Sometimes Finney seemed to get a glimpse of the true philosophy of sanctification, which should have served as a clue to lead him out into the full truth. For instance, on page 275 of his Lectures to Christians, he says, The converted person feels at peace with God, joy and gratitude fills his heart and he rejoices in having found a Savior. But, by and by, he finds the working of sin in his members, unsubdued pride, his old temper breaking forth, and a multitude of enemies assaulting his soul from within, and he is not prepared to meet them. 
This ought to have convinced Finney of the need of having those inner forces of the nature cleansed by the Holy Spirit, but it did not. He never came into the full light. 2. Here is his definition of holiness or sanctification. We have seen that holiness belongs strictly only to the will or heart, and consists in obedience of will to the law of God as it lies revealed in the intellect, that it is expressed in one word, love, that this love is identical with the entire consecration of the whole being to the glory of God. Systematic Theology, page 403. Again, sanctification as a state differing from a holy act is a standing ultimate intention and exactly synonymous or identical with a state of obedience. Page 405. Now a justified man can obey God and does obey him while he retains his justification. The above definition therefore falls utterly short of the scriptural idea of holiness which is taught by Methodism. 3. Again, Finney says, Sanctification consists in the will's devoting or consecrating itself and the whole being to the service of God. Sanctification may be entire in two senses. One, in the sense of present, full obedience, or entire consecration to God. And, two, in the sense of continued abiding consecration or obedience to God. Entire sanctification in this sense consists of being established, confirmed, and continued in a state of sanctification or of entire consecration to God. Page 405. Here again are the two fundamental and fatal mistakes of his system, so far as it relates to sanctification. He makes it consist in a devotion of the will to God a thing that is always secured by conversion and regeneration, while the scripture makes it consist in the cleansing of the whole being precisely as the Methodist Church teaches, Acts 15, 8-9. 2. He makes consecration synonymous with sanctification. But consecration is only one of several conditions of sanctification, not the thing itself. First, man consecrates himself to God, and then, by faith, receives the baptism of the Holy Spirit for the cleansing of the whole being, the sanctification of body, soul, and spirit. Man consecrates. The Holy Spirit sanctifies. Finney never got this clearly in his thought. The only difference he made between sanctification and entire sanctification was that the latter is a continued abiding obedience. President Fairchild accepted President Finney's definitions and then coolly set it all aside by denying that it was a second distinct work of grace after conversion. It was sudden and by affirming that this establishment or permanency when attained cannot reveal itself in consciousness. That is, Fairchild said, that it would take a special revelation from heaven to let a person know that his will would remain permanently loyal to God. According to this, the angels that fell, even though they may have lived in heaven with God a million years, were never wholly sanctified, because at last their wills finally broke connection with God. This was a logical inference from a false definition, and the natural result would be to dampen all ardor in the pursuit of an experience which one never could know that he had obtained. And if he did pursue it with ardor, how could he testify to the possession of it for all future time? Manifestly, he could not, for no man knows whether his present moral state will be abiding. This was precisely the effect of this false notion and definition upon Finney himself. With all his preaching of the privilege and duty of believers to be sanctified, and writing about it, and striving after it, he did not testify to it himself. He said in his Lectures to Christians on Perfection, Page 266, I do not myself profess now to have attained perfect sanctification, but if I had attained it, if I felt that God had really given me the victory over the world, the flesh, and the devil, and made me free from sin, would I keep it a secret, locked up in my own breast, and let my brethren stumble on in ignorance of what the grace of God can do? Never. Professor Wright, in his Biography of Finney, wrote, 
Still, Finney did not encourage any to announce themselves as living in a permanent state of entire consecration, sanctification. Nor was he ever known to speak of himself as having attained that state. He knew too well the deceitfulness of the human heart and the fallibility of memory to encourage such claims. And so, as the Declaration expresses it, attention was to be turned, not to the question whether any were now actually attaining this state, but whether it was attainable in any such sense that it could rationally be striven after. The believer's need, according to Finney, is to have such a revelation of the great truths of the gospel that they shall serve as a counterpoise to the abnormal developments of the lower propensities. Alas, if Finney had only paid more attention to these abnormal developments of the lower propensities and had sought the crucifixion of this old man instead of a counterpoise to it by a heart-cleansing baptism with the Holy Spirit, he would have worried less about the permanency of his will. He would have also had the removal of indwelling sin to testify to, for the Holy Spirit would have borne him witness, Acts 15, 8, 9, and Hebrews 10, 14, and 15. 4. Finney failed to connect the obtaining of sanctification with the baptism with the Holy Ghost. Sometimes he almost got the truth, as his directions to seekers occasionally show, but his discussions as a whole show that he never fully grasped the idea that the heart was cleansed of indwelling sin by the baptism with the Holy Ghost. So it came about that, with all his matchless gifts as a preacher and teacher, he was not eminently successful as a teacher of sanctification. No man in his generation studied the subject more carefully. Probably, no one even tried so hard to preach it and to lift the church from its low state of piety. No man suffered such opposition and abuse both from friends and foes for doing it. Dr. Hodge led all the Calvinists in a combined assault upon him, paying him back with compound interest for all the hard things he had said against the confession of faith and the leading points of Calvinism. Even the new school preachers, with whom he had held sweet communion and labored in blessed revivals, tore away at his reputation and lacerated his heart and opposed his college. Presbyteries passed resolutions. Doctors of divinity wrote books and pamphlets, persistently misrepresented his teachings and warned the people against him and the churches against his work, all because he strove to be holy and taught to the best of his ability that God required believers to be holy and that it was clearly possible, by the grace of God, to be holy in this present life. Had the books of John Wesley and John Fletcher and Adam Clark and Carvasso been put into his hands at the time of his conversion, it would, I believe, have been an unspeakable blessing to the kingdom of God. Had Finney held correct scriptural opinions of what sanctification is and how it is obtained, he would have been the mightiest preacher of holiness the world has yet had since St. Paul, just as he was the most successful soul winner of the centuries. As it was, a few souls here and there sought and received the baptism with the Holy Spirit and obtained the divine witness to a cleansing of heart under his preaching. Among these was President Mahan himself and Reverend Sherlock Bristol of the second graduating class, I think, of Oberlin. And we may hope Professor Cowles and Professor Morgan, both of whom wrote on the subject of holiness. The attention of the whole school was drawn to the subject of holiness and to an earnest inquiry as to its attainability in this life. There was then a perpetual revival atmosphere in Oberlin and almost a continuous revival, making that college hamlet a delightsome place where the Spirit of God had right-of-way and brooded over homes and hearts. Had Oberlin held the scriptural old-fashioned Methodist doctrine of sanctification from the beginning, she might have easily become the capital of the holiness movement of the world, and had 3,000 students today instead of less than half as many. But none of these leaders then apprehended the glorious truth in its fullness. They were feeling their way into the light. None of them ever fully reached it but President Mahan. He was born and brought up a Presbyterian and Calvinist after the straightest sect, and well nigh lost his soul from the chilling, deadening doctrines of that awful system. But through years of prayerful meditation, he struggled out into the truth, broke away from the horrors of his ancestral faith, became a congregational preacher and president of Oberlin College for 15 years, then president of a Methodist college in Michigan, 
closing his noble life for several years as an editor of a holiness journal in London. He thought the subject through and became in the closing years of his life as clear as a bell on the subject of sanctification. He was a graduate of Hamilton College and Andover Seminary, an exceptionally able preacher, a bold and vigorous thinker, an enthusiastic student of philosophy and theology, a man of keen moral intuitions and an aggressive moral reformer. He had an active, fertile mind giving to the world the following books, Mahan on the Will, Intellectual Philosophy, Moral Philosophy, Logic, Spiritualism, Natural Theology, The Baptism of the Holy Ghost, Out of Darkness into Light, Autobiography, Intellectual, Moral, and Spiritual. Though not such a genius as Finney, there were not a few who regarded him as the strongest man in the Oberlin faculty. He was baptized with the Holy Ghost in 1836, one year after he became president of the college, and from that time onward he bent the energies of his manly mind to discover the truth about sanctification. He ultimately found the happy haven of intellectual and soul rest in the Methodist doctrine of a work of grace subsequent to regeneration, obtained by faith and consisting of a cleansing of heart produced by a baptism with the Holy Ghost. He was very aggressive in defending and pushing the doctrine of sanctification. It, of course, aroused opposition to the college. This, in turn, led those in influence in the college who were formal in religion and cold to the doctrine of sanctification to oppose him at home. They wanted peace with those who opposed the doctrine of holiness. And this man was betrayed to formal professors in a Christless world and practically forced to resign from the presidency in 1850. That was the darkest day, I believe, that ever came to Oberlin, from which may be dated the beginning of her fatal spiritual decline. I have written to Rev. Sherlock Bristol of Montalvo, California, one of the few men now living who knows all the facts from the beginning of Oberlin's history, who himself was baptized with the Spirit and became a preacher, an author of great power and usefulness, to give me the facts about Mahan's resignation and Oberlin's spiritual decline. Here are selections from his letters. Montalvo, California, January 2nd, 1902. My dear brother Hills, your letter of December 28th came to hand this evening and was very cheering and encouraging. The reports of conversions and sealings of the Spirit in the Holiness University and in that part of Texas are such as we do not hear of nowadays in the northern part of the country. I think I know the reason why this is so. It is the same as made the north of Palestine more receptive of Christ than highly favored and enlightened Judea. They were less gospel-hardened, had less pride and self-conceit. I rejoice that it is so, and can heartily join with Christ in saying, Even so, Father, for so it seemed good in thy sight. The growth of your college and theological school is wonderful. How I should like to help you! But such as I have, I give a daily visit with our Lord to the school in prayer. Now, in regard to Oberlin and its steps down from the highway of holiness, where once it walked with God in the days of Finney's and Mahan's presidency, I feel reluctant to write, lest I should seem ungrateful for what that school did for me, and lest also some injustice should be done to someone. The Lord help me to write with a charity that thinketh no evil. That Oberlin has receded from the high grounds she once occupied spiritually admits of no question. President Fairchild definitely owned it in a pamphlet he published some 20 years ago and read before the faculty, securing their approval and endorsement. In it, he went so far as to say, It came to be more and more a matter of doubt whether the seeking of sanctification as a special experience was on the whole to be encouraged. And it was not, in general, an occasion of satisfaction when a young man gave himself up to seek the blessing. It was how far Oberlin had backslid from the high and apostolic ground held while President Mahan stood as a human head of the school. This leads me to trace, somewhat in detail, the steps which led to this sad departure. President Mahan was quite as prominent in those days as was Professor Finney. In my opinion, the baptism with the Spirit he received was equal to Finney's. His sermons were mighty and his influence great. Spending his vacations abroad in spiritual labors, 
he boldly urged upon Christians and converts the earnest seeking of that divine endowment foretold by the prophet Joel and experienced at Pentecost. Vast good was done, but as was to be expected, opposition appeared here and there. Letters were written from Boston and elsewhere, criticizing Mahan's preaching of the doctrine. Some of these fell into the hands of members of the faculty who did not relish the doctrine and felt restive under its demands and restraints. Revivals followed all his labors, but notwithstanding he found on his return when the term opened quite a clique combining against him. A continual dropping wears a rock. I knew these men one and all, and how assiduously they worked. During a winter vacation, while Mahan was absent in Boston, Providence, and New York, these home critics drew up a paper, and by a strong efforts persuaded a majority of the faculty to ask him to resign. It almost broke his heart, but he continued his energetic work. I left my work of gathering funds for the school, went back and persuaded the faculty to withdraw their request. He returned and resumed his work, but no more with the cordial goodwill and cooperation of former times. Finally, he resigned. I have no more doubt that it was want of spirituality that generated the opposition and fed it than I have that I write this account of the matter. Nor have I any doubt of that action being a great sin against God. From that day onward, Oberlin declined further and further from the spiritual life and power of Mahan's days, but with like steps also from the doctrine of the possible Pentecostal power. When the dear man left the school for which he had done so much, he must have felt much as Paul did when he uttered the sad words in his letter to Timothy, Thou knowest that all they of Asia are turned away from me, of whom is Phygelus and Hermogenes. Oberlin is still a large school of intellectual and moral power, but the spiritual power of other days it has no more. O oh, hadst thou known in that thy day, and flocked beneath the wing, of him who called thee lovingly thine own anointed king, then had the tribes of all the earth gone up thy pomp to see, and glory dwelt in all thy gates, and all thy sons been free. I am sure President Finney never agreed with President Fairchild in repudiating the Pentecostal baptism so plainly taught as the need and privilege of New Testament Christians. He had felt too deeply its influence within, and witnessed too much of its power without. But he was getting worn down and wearied, and he allowed things to drift as he would not have done in earlier days and he died before having seen President Fairchild's pamphlet repudiating the experience and doctrine of Mahan's administration in times. How sad the history of Oberlin! I mourn every time I look that way. Fairchild and I have exchanged many letters on the subject. He and I were very warm friends during our whole college and theological course. I do not think he loved any student more than myself, if I accept his brother Henry. He was a natural gentleman, genial, moral, of equitable temperament, and highly intellectual, non-impulsive, and little tempted toward outbreaking sins. He passed through those great Pentecostal seasons, which changed so many of us without any deep sense of his own need of a baptism with the Holy Ghost, and with little effort to obtain it. It was in that line what abnormal morality is, often, an obstacle to conversion. I fast twice in a week, I give tithes of all I possess, etc., seems to me the illusion which kept him from seeking and obtaining the gift unspeakable. Because thou sayest I am rich, etc., that is my explanation of his singular blindness, and also of his fearful leading of other blind ones also. It is God's order that we all, however intellectual, should go to Christ for light, and unless he anoints our eyes with the eye salve of heaven, we shall grope in darkness all of our days. Fairchild did not intend to be a preacher, and did not realize his need of more than natural equipments to do his work as a teacher and Christian. He ultimately threw his influence decidedly against the doctrine. He criticized it in his theology, and in his pamphlet defended the drift of Oberlin backward from the ground occupied by Finney and Mahan to that occupied by the average churches. Oberlin, with few exceptions, went with him. Faculus S. Descunsus Averni, 
Nevertheless, the seed sown is springing up all over the land. Just now there is a great struggle at Oberlin, as in other colleges, to gain large endowments of money. But what it needs more than all the gold of earth is a return to its first love, to the spirit of those early days when its students were taught to tarry in Jerusalem till endued with power from above. The retrograde steps of Oberlin were due to the persistent carpings and criticisms of men in the faculty, college, and town who had small experience in spiritual things. So chronic it became at length that better men at last yielded and consented to Mahan's departure and with him the doctrine of sanctification for the sake of peace. Oberlin's old guard, Morgan, Finney, and Cowles, and many sanctified students will mourn this concession for many a day. May other institutions take warnings, and let him that thinketh he standeth take heed, lest he fall. This is a long letter, written in haste and with sorrow. May the Lord bless you, dear brother, and preserve you, and your school from the like disaster, and unto him be the praise for ever and ever. Most affectionately, your brother, S. Bristol. This is an epitome of the sad history of sanctification in Oberlin College and churches, which Finney went to Oberlin expressly to teach. He had been in England for a year when Mahan resigned. It is evident that he had no part in bringing it about. On his return to Oberlin in 1851, he was elected to the presidency of the college and filled the place until 1865, when he in turn was asked to resign, ostensibly on account of his age possibly for the same reason that Mahan's resignation was secured. It is a significant fact that in his autobiography, Finney never mentions or alludes to his presidency of the college. Fairchild was his successor in the office, a cool, almost contemptuous rejecter of both the doctrine and experience of sanctification. He was a man of large intellectual gifts, but unusually devoid of spiritual power. I have been told by one who spent a lifetime in Oberlin that he was never known to have a conversion under his preaching. I have given this history of Finney's teaching of sanctification in Oberlin for the striking lessons which it teaches. 1. He never had the correct view. Had Mahan been let alone, the school would ultimately have reached it, the Methodist doctrine of the founders and best exponents of Methodism its sweet reasonableness and the attainability of the experience would have been so attractive and so many would have obtained it that it would have possessed the college and churches and never could have been driven out. But an unwise theory could easily be discounted and discarded by unspiritual minds. It is profoundly important to get the scriptural truth regarding any doctrine which the devil peculiarly hates and stirs up earth and hell to oppose. Of all the subjects of theology, that doctrine which he thus hates today is sanctification. 2. It is well to notice that the outside opposition to Oberlin never did her the slightest harm. So long as she was, up to her best light and knowledge, true to God and holiness, she had amazing progress. But she was betrayed by those within her own fold. Under Mahan's administration, the school grew to an enrollment of 1,000 pupils. Now, after 52 years, that enrollment has only increased about 30 or 40 percent, and I think is not as large as it was some years ago. It may in time dimly dawn on the minds of some that, in the management of a great institution of learning, there are some things to be sought after besides scholarship and money and mortar and stone. How true it is that one generation makes history, and another sits in judgment on it and decides whether it was wise or otherwise. English statesmen are now saying that England fought on the wrong side in the Crimean War. In another generation, they will sit in judgment upon the wisdom of the present war in South Africa. It was no doubt thought to be a master stroke of policy to get rid of Mahan and make peace with those who fought sanctification. Now we can look back and see what fearful strides Oberlin has made worldward since that hour. During one of his last years of teaching, President Fairchild said in a classroom, a wave of the world has struck Oberlin. Probably, he little dreamed that it was by his own hand that the world struck. Reverend Dr. Brand was Finney's successor as pastor of the First Congressional Church of Oberlin. 
Professor Henry Churchill King is Fairchild's successor as teacher of systematic theology as he followed Finney. For two years, Professor King was potential in the college while the trustees were seeking for a president and calling President John Barrows. He introduced card playing as an allowable pastime for the students, which for more than 60 years had been interdicted. He did it, too, against the tearful protest of Dr. Brand, who literally died soon after with a broken heart because of this fresh cyclone of worldliness which had been broken over the place, making a revival of religion impossible. An alumnus said to me that, during Professor King's short term of power, he inflicted an evil upon the institution that it will not recover from in a quarter of a century. Will it ever do it? When at the great alumni gathering in 1900, Professor King stood up before the vast throng and grew red in the face defending the Oberlin's card playing and worldliness amidst the clapping of the students and the sorrow and pain of the old graduates and friends of Oberlin, he only proved two things. One, that he was stung by criticisms of this modern life in the college, and two, that the criticisms were deserved. A man of national reputation, not a son of Oberlin, but well acquainted with it, many years ago told me that he thought there was more pure religion in Oberlin than in any other place of its size on the globe. But in 1900, two men high up in official and professional life in Oberlin told me there was no special reason why anyone should come to Oberlin for the sake of its peculiar religious opportunities. This may seem a light thing to some, but to us who love Oberlin and the kingdom of Christ, it is sad beyond description. The case, then, stands thus. Mahan and Finney tried to teach sanctification and to make it a living experience in the college and church. Fairchild stabbed it to death, and King joyfully buried it under a mountain pile of euchre decks. 3. There is a lesson here for our own Texas Holiness University and for any other colleges who have had or may ever have the truth on the subject of holiness. Let it be known as a matter of history that this school was planted with the avowed purpose of giving the most careful training to the intellects of our pupils while the Lord sanctified their hearts. And as a result, the Lord has sent us nearly 300 students in the last four months from 14 states, and 95 of them have been saved or sanctified. 173 knelt at our altar and found God in conversion or sanctification during the year 1901, and more than 100 found Him the year before. And our school is not yet two years and a half old. If this is the way God builds up a school that daily teaches sanctification as a work of grace subsequent to conversion wrought in the heart by the baptism with the Holy Ghost, it is good enough for me. Holiness evangelists and Methodist ministers inform me that some Methodist authors and institutions are forsaking their own pure faith and are playing with Fairchild's theory. I warn them, one and all, it will be fatal to the spirituality of the man or institution that tries it. I challenge one and all to show that any other than the old Methodist theory of sanctification has ever been permanently and successfully worked with commanding results. If we give this truth half a chance in our hearts and institutions, the Spirit of God will clothe us with power, and we shall be more than conquerors over a frowning world and all the hosts of hell. But we will return to a few closing words about the great soul, a brief picture of whose noble life we have been giving to the world. Henry Ward Beecher heard him preach twice in London at the time of his first visit to England. He wrote back to the New York Independent that there were a thousand inquirers at the close of each service. Nor, wrote he, have we ever witnessed more solemnity, order, and unexceptionable propriety in the conduct of meetings than has prevailed under Mr. Finney at the tabernacle. Whoever speaks against this work speaks not against Mr. Finney, but against all revivals. At the farewell meeting in London, after nine months of preaching by Finney, nearly every night in his church, Dr. Campbell said, We cannot say that we are much gratified at the thought of Mr. Finney's returning to college duties in the general ministry of a rural parish. We do not consider that such is the place for the man, and we must be allowed to think that 15 years ago a mistake was committed when he became located in the midst of academic bowers. He is made for the millions. His place is the pulpit rather than the professor's chair. He is a heaven-born sovereign of the people. The people he loves and the mass of the people all but idolize him. His rare gifts are of signal service in enabling Mr. Finney to fathom the deepest recesses of the human heart and to throw light on the darkest portions of human character. 
for moral anatomy, he has no equal among the multitude of great and successful preachers whom it has been our lot to hear. He is a man singularly endowed for evangelistic labors. We doubt if, in all the 40,000 preachers of America, there are many, if one, that possess all the qualifications above enumerated. Writes Finney, page 295 through 301. In this picture of this great soul winner, we should have made him more lifelike and human if we had dwelt more upon his personal characteristics and given a few of the quaint incidents of his life. But the purpose of this brief story was too grave to admit of it. It possibly might be thought about this stern preacher of righteousness with his unbending integrity and awful sense of obligation to God and the sacredness of duty would be hard and unlovely in the home. Precisely the opposite was true. He was simple and tender and sweet as a child in his home life. His affection for his family was unbounded and they almost idolized him. He was a mighty man of prayer, and prayer is one of the most sacred and precious privileges vouchsafed to mortals. Here are two scenes of this Elijah in prayer. The summer of 1853 was unusually hot and dry, so that the pastures were scorched, and there seemed likely to be a total failure of the crops. Under these circumstances, the great congregation gathered one Sabbath in the church at Oberlin as usual, when, though the sky was clear, the burden of Finney's prayer was for rain. In his prayer he deepened the cry of distress, which went up from every heart by mentioning in detail the prolonged drought in about these words. We do not presume, O Lord, to dictate to thee what is best for us. Yet, Thou dost invite us to come to thee as children to an earthly father and tell thee all our wants. We want rain. Our pastures are dry. The earth is gaping open for rain. The cattle are wandering about and lowing in search of water. Even the little squirrels in the woods are suffering from thirst. Unless thou givest us rain, our cattle will die and our harvest will come to naught. O oh Lord, send us rain and send it now. Although to us there is no sign of it, it is an easy thing for thee to do it. Send it now, Lord, for Christ's sake. Amen. He took a text and began to preach, but in a few minutes had to stop for the noise of the rattle and roar of the storm. He paused and said, We would better stop and thank God for the rain. He then gave out the hymn, When all thy mercies, O my God, my rising soul surveys. Another scene I have heard described by a student who was an eyewitness. A theological class was about to graduate and go out into the world as ambassadors for God. They came to the recitation, and as usual, he opened the class with prayer. As he prayed, the thought of the solemnity of their calling came over him. The unfriendly world they must face with all its depressing temptations, the importance of their success, the need of the church, the worth of souls, he prayed on and on with increasing tenderness and fervor through the hour, until the hour bell rang for the next recitation, when they tiptoed out of the room, leaving him still in prayer. And here we will leave him, with a passion of souls upon him, praying for the endowment of power upon the ministry, for the sanctification of believers in the church, and for the salvation of a dying world.